I started in crypto actually in 2011, was mining Bitcoin in university. So I would see that there will be a harmonization between governments and uh, blockchain ecosystems. And uh, we're actually happy that Torn is actually based out of here right now. And uh, I think we want to do our best to support this ecosystem because like you said, there's a few free zones here which are also very pro crypto. It's top five coins, there'll be solution layers to say how do you uh, mass transactions. I think we need like this privacy layer Definitely, like, of course, I agree. no discussion. I think GameFi and you know, uh, game platforms is one of the strongest use cases for blockchain. So, hello fellows. Today we have a super interesting talk uh, with Hank from DWF Labs Fund. Today we're going to talk a lot about what is the investor side of Tonica system and it was this talk would be super interesting for the projects for the future developers and future builders on Ton to understand when how and by whom they can be like supported in a certain time when they will start to build their products so stay tuned it will be super interesting I'm glad you found time for us Hank to spend it with me and talk about all these things so First question for you, okay, would you be so kind, please, and like talk about you and about like DWF Labs, so we just can have a short intro about who we have here. Great, thank you, Anton. Thanks for having me. My name is Heng. I am one of the four partners of DWF Labs. So let me explain to you what DWF Labs do and what we stand for. So DWF Labs is part of a parent company called Digital Wave Finance. Uh, it was founded in Switzerland in 2018, high-frequency trading crypto firm. And this year, we spin off DWF Labs to do investments in the Web3 space and also to market make for projects in the ecosystem. So we have created a decentralized global team to support this effort. And as part of this initiative, we are also supporting the Torn ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, sorry for interrupting you while watching this awesome interview, but I have some cool information. Right now, a global Torn Dora Hex hackathon is taking place. And uh, I want to remind you that prize pool is $300,000. So if you have a project, or maybe you ever considered building something for Tong, this is your biggest chance. Follow the link in the description, join the list of the projects that are taking part in Dora Hacks Hackathon, and get portion of the prize pool. And even if you're watching now, and the Dora Hacks Hackathon is already over, you still didn't miss everything. So. Uh, follow another link in the description that is leading you to the Tone Co platform. So you can meet other builders, you can meet other developers. We have a lot of online events where you could get support from top guys from the industry, from the Tone ecosystem. And uh, we are there to help you to succeed with your project, even with funding, even with investments. So don't miss out on this opportunity. And I'm super happy that you're watching our interview and I hope that it gets a lot of the value for you and your project. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's about you, Hank? Like, how did you get here and what is your previous experience? Great. So, uh, my, me myself, personally, I'm born and bred in Singapore. Uh, spent some time in the UK as well. I started in crypto actually in 2011, I was mining Bitcoin in university. And then after that, you know, I graduated from university. I started doing uh, cybersecurity, which is, you know, uh, defend, defending networks, computers. And also over time, I actually also went into blockchain security. So in the last three years, I managed to meet my current partners uh, in Moscow. And then we talked about, you know, setting up a investment business. This is why DWF Labs came about. Because also over the last few years, I've also been involved in crypto on the side. You know, I've been doing OTC, I've been, following projects, doing my own personal investments. Uh, okay, Hank, thank yeah. you for this. Can you tell us more like how DWF is like based globally? What is your local interest or how actually like you are working? Great. Okay. So we are like most Web3 firms. We have people working remotely. We also have physical presence like in the form of offices in Zug, Switzerland, uh, in Dubai, in the MCC, in Singapore, in Korea, South Korea, in Hong Kong. And I think we have people spread across the whole world. Okay, yeah. and now we're here in Dubai. That's right. What is your interest here? I know it is like center of crypto world in some point, like what, what do we do here? Right, we think that the Middle Eastern and North African market is very promising and very interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of 
potential use case for blockchain in the space. And uh, we're actually happy that Torn is actually based out of here right now. And uh, I think we want to do our best to support this ecosystem because like you said, there's a few free zones here which are also very pro-crypto. We know that most of the major crypto firms have, have a presence here as well in terms of getting a license or having you know, business activity, innovation, technology hub. Yeah. Okay. Now we're here because of Ton. That's right. How did you get to Ton? What is your expectations so, about it and what is behind your beliefs? Good question. So I, the reason why we got to know Ton professionally was because we have some mutual friends with the Ton Foundation members, mm -hmm. right? And we actually, before this, we have looked into Ton, you know, because back then it was still part of uh, the whole Telegram thing, right? So we, we know about this thing. And then because of this mutual friends and connections, we, you know, we, we looked into it deeper. And we started to you know, discuss about formalizing partnership, right? And I think this is the best time we can do this, right? When, when the market is uh, in such a uh, turmoil, you know, we think that this is a good time to you know, show that there is a you know, new technology out there. Best time to establish business exactly. and to build right now. Like, Perfect. Otherwise, it's going to be late, right? Exactly, that's right. Okay, uh, what is like from your perspective, again, where everyone is like comparing Ethereum, Solana, other ecosystems, now we have here Ton, yeah. and there is a lot of like speeches about, okay, Ton, close to Telegram, it has some potential in terms of like distribution. That's right. What is your like perspective on it? Where do you see like this biggest, if you are presenting Ton yes. to other investors, yeah. how do you explain what is unfair advantage of Look. this ecosystem? Right, okay, so I think, most people would associate Ton with Telegram, but I mean, it's very clear right now, you can see that the community is independent and separate from Telegram. I think Definitely. this is what I would tell investors as the first uh, thing. And second thing is that I think Telegram itself, uh, sorry, not Telegram, but Ton itself is actually an evolution of the blockchain technology. Yep. It's what we call a fifth generation blockchain. And I think what we see as improvement over Solana or Ethereum is that if you look at blockchain, there is tr uh, what we call the, uh, the trilemma of scalability, speed, and security, right? So how Torn solves this, this trilemma is actually by using Byzantine sort tolerance, which allows for scalability and security. Uh, it's also desk charting, which allows for speed. Mm -hmm. And also lastly, it has one of the other functions, which is the multiple chain, which is the work Sharding. chain. Exactly, that's right, yeah. Okay, I understand. Uh, where do you see the perfect role of DWF Labs like in three years in this ecosystem or in five years? What would be like perfect ideal state for you? Great, great question. So we did have a deep think about how we can support the Torn ecosystem and also to also play on our strengths. Our strength is that as we are one of the you know, uh, more active you know, trading firms in the space. Mm -hmm. So we provide liquidity in the market. So one thing we want to do is actually to help Torn uh, have a more active, you know, user base and community in terms of like the, you know, tradable token in the market, right? Okay. That's one. Uh, secondly, can you sorry, like sorry for interrupting. Can you explain me how it will happen? Okay. What are the exact steps, like, so people can understand? Understood. What is this like value in it? Got it. Right. Okay. So, so what we kind of do is, as a first step, we are purchasing Torn tokens, mm -hmm. right? The reason for doing this is so that we can provide market making in key uh, listed markets. So this is to create a thriving ecosystem uh, market for you know community users to go trade the token and not worry that you know the prices will move in a volatile way. So we stabilize the market for mm -hmm. for Torn token. So that will attract normal users to have some confidence in, in the token, right? Uh, but to take a more broader view of what we're gonna do, we are also purchasing more tokens. We have purchased more than one million Torn tokens, and we're gonna buy more to be a one of the significant validators to secure the Torn ecosystem and then the blockchain against you know, attacks. So what we're trying to do is to create diversity mm -hmm. so that you know, have that different validators that are independent of one another so that you, know, you cannot have any manipulation. Yeah. Okay. That's what. Okay. Uh, now you're going to be like market maker. What's about like staking? Do you have any particular interest in it? Yes, absolutely. Good question. So this is a proof of stake blockchain and we want to also build uh, a staking pool to be one of the uh, competitive staking pools so that you know, users can actually come and stick their, 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 their Torn uh, tokens you know, in our pool. And you know, this also secures the blockchain, right? With more you know, of these staking pools, creates a thriving ecosystem. Are you already like, building your own solution or you're gonna like, use some third parties? 
how it's going to work. We, we are building our own solution. It's work in progress and we'll announce it once it's ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is going to be like announcement? Like it's topic of months, weeks, I, I, or within a year? I think it'll year? be a matter of between uh, the next two to three quarters. Okay. We'll, we'll be launching the, the, the staking pool uh, because I think this is the first time we actually built a staking pool which is, you know, facing, uh, you know, uh, retail and normal users, right? Mm -hmm. So we have never done this before. So I think we're also evaluating the technology. Okay. Uh, I've talked to many DEXs on Ton. Yes, right. Everyone have uh, liquidity problems. Mm -hmm. Liquidity problems, they also need like projects, they need stable coin, Correct. they need like liquidity. That's right. Do you have any particular interest in supporting like individual players like DEXs, who's going to like start and how it's going to look like? Great. So I think our investment philosophy is to, circuit, uh, to, to invest in different parts of the ecosystem, including uh, markets as well, right? So DEX is definitely in our focus, especially, you know, with centralized exchange, you know, having all these um, issues right now with, you know, limit order books. So we do look at DEX, but I think what we're trying to do now is to also evaluate and see which potential DEX could be the strongest in the market. Because, you know, let's say if 10 DEXs come out in the market, we couldn't possibly invest in all 10 of it, right? So we need to make bets as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Now, I know there's really like at least four projects. That's right. And... Uh... I had very interesting discussion like with them. Everyone is like struggling with it and like normally LPs, investors come in and providing like liquidity to one player. Have you ever met a system where like uh, DEXs will create some kind of LNs and would share liquidity? I think, I think this is the future of uh, DEXs where you know, they, they share a, you know, liquidity and a, even potentially a common order book. So it actually creates a more um, real pricing. So this is like, you know, like if you have different markets, some has more liquid, some has less liquid, the price will be different. And then you, people can arbitrage until it, you know, it comes to price equilibrium, right? So I think our role as a market maker is to create a responsible and uh, tight price marketplace. Mm -hmm. So this is why I think as, as a market maker, when we invest into DEXs, we also want to be a liquidity provider there. Okay, so does it mean that you're gonna like build this DEX for DEXs? Because it's like we're talking about like liquidity yes. pool, Correct. which will be working based on the smart contracts, providing Correct. liquidity at the same time for Correct. more exchanges. And there should be like kind of tough rules Correct. for everyone. So it's like, uh, and question is, who's gonna build this? Should it be like some one of the founders in Ton community, yes. or this is a role of investment company? So I think uh, a pool of pool, I think the idea that you're suggesting is something very interesting. We did look at it before. Uh, what we're trying to do is that we, we think that there is a, a use case for this. However, what we need to do also is to sh make sure that the Torn ecosystem is not centralized, controlled by one strong party. So, you know, it could be something where, you know, let's say each of the DEXs are also a part owner of it to prevent, you know, over-dominance. Yes. Yeah. But I think, again, like one... I like your question, and this is like super interesting discussion because when I uh, when I was thinking about it, basically to use these pools or liquidity provided DEX for DEXs, yes. there first should be still some kind of alliance mm -hmm. between like those starting DEXs, right? Because Correct. we're talking about it's not like Ethereum. In Ethereum, it's like already grown up Correct. like a system. Here we have kindergarten mm -hmm. with like four kids trying like to start play based on the new rules okay. and they need new set of toys and they're missing something and kindergarten bringing them like here is a starter okay. for you and yes. you will share it fairly. So this is kind of like it's centralized in some terms but also what we should like achieve is this future maybe, maybe like diversification like through smart contracts so it will be like fair to start but if you want to grow up or overgrew yes. this liquidity it's already your own play i yes. mean if i would talk like for dex wait i think this is this is a good point uh i think this is where ton can actually innovate and be a, a leader in the space so like you said we can create some common framework or standard between dexes right to interoperate and communicate in, in a form that is like a liquidity network right so i think this this whole interoperability thing is very interesting it creates a more uh, mutually beneficial relationship between DEXs. You know, it can be competition, but it can also help each other mutually, right? And if you look at the European Union right now, they are requiring interoperability between different messaging apps. 
what's stopping them from having the same rule for blockchain taxes in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So we should be forward thinking and th think about this thing as well. I think what the, the Ton Foundation and the developer community sh should do is to come up with some standards, common standards for, you know, like how to spin up a, a generic tax which communicates with other decks. And then from there, you know, from kindergarten, you can graduate to high school. High school, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. And yeah, adult business. I know this model because I used to work with centralized exchanges yes. and also I had like experience in my career with payment gates. Yes. And uh, among clients we had, it was like a payment gate, uh, crypto to fiat yes. for Forex exchanges. And Forex exchanges, basically like Forex brokers, there is like tens of them That's right. globally, right? And there is like three up to 10 like liquidity providers. Yeah. It's absolutely the same model in the centralized world. Correct. Have you met this kind of model in crypto in another ecosystems or it's like absolutely new concept which is just like discussing around? Actually, this concept, you know, even in the current centralized exchange space, it's very common, right? A lot of the tier two exchanges actually tap liquidity from like, you know, a tier one exchange. Yeah. Yeah. They, their order book might not be, you know, a real order book. Right? It might be just mirroring and, and, uh, the liquidity from another exchange. So uh, it's just not very visible publicly, but you know, it's very Yeah. Important. Binance, Kraken, all, all of right. them like providing their books exactly. for another like kindergarten exchange. Exactly. Exactly. But on DEX, yeah. is it existing somewhere on DEX? Uh, we are not aware of it happening, so I think this is why I think we need to do more research and see if you know, this could be something to look into, right? Yeah. Okay. Because I think the, the point of the philosophy of a DEX is that it's decentralized. I think the, a lot of the first generation DEXs want to be independent, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Even if there's no liquidity, they want to show that you know, it's independent, fully decentralized, smart contract that doesn't query other oracles or something like that. Yeah. I have also another like, interesting question. When we're talking about like DEXs, everyone like, First impression is decentralized, right? But we have stable coins. That's right. They are centralized, yeah. most of them. So right. basically, if they will fail, all DEXs will fail. Correct. How do you see the future of this question? How it's going to be like solved? What, okay. what, is, what should be done? So I think there is uh, you know, an ideal end state where everything is decentralized, right? I think that is a very uh, far future. That, we, that, that, will have, that this will happen. Five years, 10 years? I think more than 10 years. You think about the DEXs right now, there's still a lot of security issues with smart contracts. Yeah. You know, there's so many things that could have break when you query a price oracle, let's say on Chainlink, you know, if the price is off like you know, UST, everything goes crazy, right? How yeah. do you stop that from happening, right? So what you need to do is that you need to have uh, both centralization and decentralized and find a middle point, which is a sweet spot. So let's say you're querying prices, you want to query multiple oracles for redundancy, right? So you create a more resilient system where you don't just uh, have a single point of failure, right? So for example, you mentioned stablecoin is centralized right now. I mean, there are projects out there looking to create decentralized stablecoins. And I think that's something that we want to look into supporting as well, because it helps to, you know, I think this is where technology innovation happens in different parts of the ecosystem. And then let's say three years from now, you can see that each part becomes more decentralized because of all these different innovations happening at the same time. Definitely, definitely, that's absolutely true. Uh... Do you have another topics like related to DEX, stable coins? Because other yes. part of the interview will be related to projects. Yes. If you are investing in any like particular ones. So we'll cover already like something more interested like for individual founders. Mm. Yeah. But I want to close this topic about like stable coins and if you have something interesting also to talk about here. I think what came to my mind yesterday was during the FAQ session, you were talking about stable coin. You yeah. know, how about use case? Who is, what is a killer use case that will allow uh, uh, adoption, mass adoption of mm -hmm. Torn, right? So first thing for stable coin, if let's say USDT has a Torn version, you know, it'd be crazy. I mean, that's the most important use case, right? Yeah. Like, let's say um, wallet on Telegram is also a killer app. So I think what we can talk about is killer use cases, you know? Okay, perfect. So I will switch around. Okay, thank you, Han, for your answers. Uh, we touched stable coins. Yeah. What is your vision? about stable coins on Torn, because this is one of the core problems, I think right now for the ecosystems, it should be like solved, and what it will bring to the market and Torn ecosystem in general. Great. So I think stable coin is one of the biggest use cases in the cryptocurrency space, just because, you know, it's a medium of exchange between everyone, and it's also a store of value. So let's say a retail user goes on, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency space, you need, you need a, a base currency to, to hold and uh, assure you that you have some stability and some, uh, you know, sort of credit in the ecosystem to spend and to do other, you know, utility. So for example, let's say we take USDT or USDC, right? It's on two major uh, blockchains, ERC20 Ethereum and TRC20 Tron, right? 
So you can see that there is a huge disparity between the ERC20 and the TRC20 version of USDT in the sense that, you know, the Tron version is so much faster and cheaper. And cheaper. Exactly. Which is why, you know, it's actually a bigger percentage of the whole network, right? People use ERC20 for stability. People use TRC20 for speed and, mm. and convenience, right? So I would say that TRC20 uh, version of stable coins have more, you know, mass adoption. Right. So basically, this is also potential for Ton, correct? So this is where I'm leading to Ton. You know, the the whole like speed and uh, uh, scalability of the network to support a stable coin, uh, an existing stable coin. Of course, we can always come up with new stable coins, but I think this requires uh, general adoption across different blockchain. You cannot have a, a, a single blockchain stable coin. I don't think that is uh, going to work very successfully. It would be very isolated. And also, it would be very bias you know in some people perceive yes. it to be a bias to a network right yeah you want to have uh, resilience across different multiple blockchains so let's say you know you have a stable coin solana solana goes down tomorrow what do you do you need to spend money still right you, there needs to yeah. be a bridge where you can convert it to a different blockchain yeah. okay how do you see i really like about the ton actually there is more huge markets on ton right there is like russian speaking countries so That's the right. whole region then we have Spanish-speaking countries, mm -hmm. the whole region. Yeah. There is English-speaking countries, Chinese, Korean community, right. and so on. Uh, where, maybe like from your expectations, where do you see the next like wave of adoption? Is there is any particular region where Ton technology and maybe like stable coin that will appear here, yeah. which market it will target the most, or which market will maybe adopt it the fast, the yeah. fastest way? Yeah. My question is related to the understanding where people should look, okay. which market to understand, okay. and where be because like developing wallet for Russia maybe not so attractive. Mm -hmm. How developing wallet like for Korean market? Yes. Okay. So I think people look at Ton when they look at Telegram. There is a, some kind of early association, right? Yeah. So where markets where Telegram is thriving, there would be naturally a Ton ecosystem or interest in it, because a wallet on Ton Telegram would be one of the biggest use cases, right? Yes. So because of that, you think about where the user base of people who use Telegram to resist censorship, you know, or in, in, in economies where, you know, the, 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 the currency is not stable. So I'll give you a very big example. Just one country alone, for example, Turkey, is one of the biggest users of stablecoin. Yeah, yes. because of, you know, uh, you know fl currency fluctuation. Inflation. Right? Yeah, inflation. Argentina, you know, El Salvador maybe. Yeah. So what we're looking at is emerging economy where, you know, big populations maybe a uh, very strong local uh, language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, let's say any country that has more than 50 million, dollar, 50 million population would be a strong ecosystem, like Korea, like Turkey, you know, I'll give you examples like that, right? Okay. Where their currency might not be the uh, strongest or there is capital control, which doesn't allow the citizens to transact very easily, you know, internationally, cross-border. Yeah. yeah. And like one part of those kind of emerging ecosystems is always exchanging the value. So basically I'm sending where you, with you together in one like ecosystem, I'm sending you like USDT on yeah. Ton. Yeah. What else should be done like for the ecosystem? Because like receiving money is just only one problem. Yeah. Second problem is basically like, cash out or spending those kind That's of money. Right. Yeah. So what else like wallet is a killer feature, USDT killer feature on yeah. Ton. What else should be done? in the ecosystem so people will be not only like sending money just because of fun yeah. between each other how fast it works right. but real utility after it yes so there is a hierarchy of uh, needs right what, what you need to do with money right first thing of course is uh, means of transfer right and second what you do is look to use money to earn more money right which is investment products or like you know staking feature right where you have you right i mean you is a bad word in this market right now, but if you think about it, it's no different from bank interest rate, right? Mm -hmm. You put money in somewhere, you know, it makes you more money. So I think this is what attracts a lot of people, right? And we're talking still more about like people who have more money, right? Because yeah, like if we're talking true. about emerging markets, there is like huge layer of poor people for whom like is just cashing out mm -hmm. one of the major problems. Yeah. So basically, we're, okay, we're dividing market to stake in it. That's right. Earning more money, yeah. buy my money. And then about like spending money, right? Yes, yeah. Is there is any like layer behind it, in between it? So I think also with, there'll be the whole decentralized gig economy, people making money remotely. I think they want to get paid. Let's say, you know, I hire a designer somewhere else. And, you know, like you say, he wants to make money, right? 
there's two ways. Either I send him money via PayPal, but he might not have a PayPal account because of you know limits, like you said, that like maybe they're not high income earners. They, mm-hmm. they might not qualify. So this actually allows you to bypass the whole banking network to pay you know people with good skills remotely, and then they would then go cash out with someone else in their local ecosystem, right? Peer to peer. Yeah. Peer to peer is very important in emerging markets, Correct. right? Exactly. Uh, when we're talking about like. Because I'm building a platform yeah. which exactly allow you to pay out contractors globally. And we're solving this problem that in some regions, even like people not only unbanked, but they're also like undocumented. Correct. Do you see any solution in Ton? Do you see any solution on blockchain like for it? Yes. So I think recently there's a lot of chatter about soulbound uh, tokens and soulbound wallets. Well, I believe that, you know, in the future, I'm just predicting, you know, a messaging app like Telegram or even like some other, you know, platform can say, okay, each of this account can be a soul bound token, right? So that acts as your digital identity to accept payments, you know, to qualify for KYC, you know. Yeah. In in, in the absence of, you know, lack of documentation in some countries, some people don't have any uh, legal documentation, right? Yeah. For me, it's always like a ch- challenge to understand how those, how those people will be like KYC'd. That's right. Or basically, because I, if I don't have any passport, what I can do, like I have my mobile phone number, yes. I have my face, yeah. and that's probably it. Correct. So, so eventually in the future, someone needs to look into the Torn ecosystem, needs to look at how to create this kind of uh, identity, uh, what we call federated identity, you know, where let's say your Telegram user ID or your, let's say your Facebook user ID or somewhere, phone number, right, can be tied to, you know, your person, your biometric feature, you know, and then, you know, from that, you know, we can say someone certify you as being who you are. And then we rely on that as a, as a baseline. Yeah. That's a super interesting idea. So it basically means that Telegram at some moment can become some kind of like KYC centralized, like, but at the same time, the centralized partner yes. who would like confirm identities of millions of people yes. just by their like biological factors. So this, this is what we call identity as a service, right? Let's say, you know, in the future, you, you're on board with an exchange. It could be a centralized exchange, it should be a DEX, right? But even DEX in the future might have strict regulations to say that you must KYC all users. Mm-hmm. So how do you share that I have a real identity but not give them the real information like your ID, right? Let's say you have your photo ID, and you don't want to trust a decentralized exchange because they might get hacked, you know, or whatever happens, right? So you have to use this intermediary service, which says that, okay, you are who you are, but without sharing that information. Okay. Yeah. Question reg- related to regulation. Yeah. And I think I have two questions. First one, topic that you touched already, mm-hmm. maybe DX, DX, DEXs will all start to be like regulated. Yeah. Do you see it in any like future close to us or it's like really a topic in five, ten years when regulators will need to understand what to do about it because now they're lost. Yes. Right. I think this regulation of DEXs will not happen very soon. Not within the next three years, my prediction. I mean, for the first country to do DEX uh, regulation because the, the regulators don't even understand centralized crypto exchanges. What more DEXs, right? They need to hire people to, to learn about this thing and they struggle to do that, right? So, so regulation definitely is catching up. First thing they will go after is um, centralized exchange and then stable coins, and then investment products. I think DEX is so decentralized that, you know, to even regulate, you need to know where these guys are, right? Where are their servers? You know, it's not easy. It's a cat and mouse game, right? You know, some of these are hosted on IPFS, you know, all these yeah. you know, anonymous uh, uh, decentralized methods, right? So I would say what they can only do is restrict their citizens of the countries from using these services in some ways. Like China did. Like China did, for example, and also how, you know, US government sanctioned Tornado Cash, for example, right? Uh, I mean, you can say, okay, you, you, the, the citizens of the country cannot use it, but if they use VPN or they use something else, you know, you cannot really stop them. Yeah. US, China, those two countries, like, in the same way, in some ways, they're same because they try, like, to restrict stuff. That's right. On the other side, like, US is quite more open to it. Mm. I think the perception is that they can't fight against it because yeah. they're people like highly educated having access to the capital so basically they need to become some kind of friendly at the end with crypto how do you see like potential how do you see a potential future for those markets how it will like look in five years yeah if china will allow it if us will become like most regulated country for crypto 
if you have any ideas about it. So I think that governments, countries, at the end of the day, need to harmonize with crypto and uh, the existence of cryptocurrencies, right? They, what they're trying to do now is just to see, okay, how do we regulate? How do we control it? How do we access the information that we require, right? At the end of the day, the governments want to do is, you know, be able to tax something, right? So crypto something is something that they cannot tax yet. So, you know, as an ecosystem or as a builder in the space, eventually you want to build something that's compliant with government regulations. So I would see that there will be a harmonization between governments and uh, blockchain ecosystems. It will come to some point in the middle where I say, okay, we agree that this is how we cooperate. You know, if we ask for information, this is, you will provide information. You know, you'll not be just totally anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. About anonymity, there is still like some private coins on the market, right? Yeah. And they're trying to be like delisted from Binance and other huge like exchanges. Even like despite the fact that nobody says like you should delist it, yeah. but uh, companies or big exchanges, tier one, trying to behave like in a friendly way to the regulators. Okay, we will do it because yeah. we don't have want to have a problems. What I see, I really like conception of blockchain because it's like unhackable. It allows you to do a lot of things, but it's also like transparent. Yeah. In some ways, it is very, very transparent. Correct. And if I'm talking about like, okay, we'll have this killer feature, USDT on Ton, I will have wallet in my Telegram, it is perfect, smooth experience. But I'm like, on the hand, I'm visible like for everyone, for what I'm paying for, because here I've bought like tickets, and here I'm buying like my something that I don't want to show, even if it is just like kitchenery, yeah. you know? What is gonna happen? What is the future about it? Because I think still people need some kind of privacy. Yeah. Do we have ability in the future to have privacy with Stone or other like open blockchains, which are not like, which are different from Monero? This is a very good uh, intellectual question to ask, actually. Um, you know, if you look at the current market, there's only privacy coin and non-privacy coins, right? Yes. So privacy coins is a very good concept, right? Everyone says, okay, I want to have privacy over how I spend my money. But if you look at Monero and all other smaller privacy coins, there's no liquidity in the market. That's the problem. You have privacy, but you have no liquidity. You know, it's yes. not liquidity traded between people, right? So I would say that a lot of these privacy coins will, will go to zero. This is my thesis because centralized exchanges don't support them. Um, there's not enough liquidity, no enough demand. So what happens is that I think maybe the top five coins, there'll be solution layers to say, how do you uh, mask transactions? Like, let's say, for example, Torn. Eventually, you know, there'll be research around how do you, you know, make it difficult on the blockchain, on on-chain explorer to see, you know, someone's wallet and how this person spent, right? There could be some way to, you know, layer it. And I, I mean, I don't mean in a way that, you know, it's like uh, illegal, like money laundering, but, you know, for small payments, for example, you want to be able to hide, you know, where it goes to. Yeah. yeah, because right now, like regulators in Europe, they're saying like you're able to purchase Bitcoin without like KYC, but under the value of 1,000 euro, for yes. example. Correct. And, but what I see here is that they still like, with which years they try and like to put more and more restrictions mm -hmm. to basically like trace everything. Yeah. Because if I can do like it once, anonymized, yeah. like 1,000 euro, I just can do more transactions. Yes. So I will be, and let's, let's be honest, like, globally huge amount of people in the world 1000 euro per month is quite a huge amount of money Correct. for them so they can live on it like yeah. during the whole month and definitely it allows regulators to avoid like huge dirty transactions mm -hmm. but in general it still can be like it is allowed for people to do it i think we need like this privacy layer Definitely, like of course, I agree. no discussions, I agree. and I don't see solution. So, so one example, just to think a little bit further in terms of research, is that you know there are like HD wallets, you know, one address and a spin of separate wallets, which will have new addresses. So when you follow it, it's just one transaction at a time. You don't see anything else that's, uh, from the previous mm -hmm. wallet, right? So that's one of the significant improvement in blockchain technology. Okay, the form of HD wallets, child wallets, right? Yeah. Do we have it already on Tom? I'm not familiar. I need to look at the white paper again. I believe this has been implemented. Uh, this is, you know, if you go to crypto exchanges, you can always create more like child wallets, addresses, yeah. right? So that no one can see you. It, it's a new address with no past transactions. But still, I will transfer to this new wallet my funds yes. and it will be traceable back. You cannot see the parent address. You can only see the child address. 
Yeah, but I can always like, uh, definitely, but there is like a child address from which I'm making my purchase. Yeah. But I need to import my money here. So That's basically right. I will do a transaction from my parent wallet. Yes. And in the blockchain, I will be able to trace this. That's right. There are some ways to still trace part of this thing, but I think improvements in the space would be uh, useful. I think even for us as an investment firm, we look at privacy technology in the space, uh, even pri privacy blockchains. So I think we can learn some of these privacy blockchains and even propose it in, as an improvement to the Torn blockchain itself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is something that we were interested be, to be funding, mm -hmm. like we said. Uh, but go back to the more fundamental question of whether blockchain can be used for like, you know, illegal activity and money laundering. If you think about it, I think cash is more anonymous. <laughs> right? Cash is more anonymous. Exactly, right, right yeah. But in so, many cases, again, we're talking about that developing markets going to get their money because they're parents or someone who is working in the Europe right. sending money to them right. yeah. and appearance of peer-to-peer -peer platforms on those appearing markets is huge and very active so basically a lot of exchanges will happen like in crypto and the crypto going to be like open so yeah. to get to cash it's already a challenge yes. right so and cash will disappear probably you know what within I, like 10 years yes. or something correct yeah so what I am thinking of, based on what you have said right now, as it could be a big problem statement for the Torn uh, Foundation as well, the Torn Coin Fund as well, is to have a challenge statement to say, can someone come up with a privacy solution which allows privacy or masking of transactions on the Explorer, but mm -hmm. you know, potentially to comply with regulations, some people can unlock or decrypt that information, okay. right? Like let's say, uh, validators, you know, five of the validators coming together can unlock the transaction for reg compliance purposes. So that's an interesting concept. Yeah. I really like, because where I see the future of crypto is basically crypto should get on the level of the same, not transparency, it's the wrong word, but it should be so much easier to use the same as cash. Yes, absolutely. So and cryptocurrency it means should be the like, digital cash, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then it means like in terms of regulation, crypto should get somewhere here. Yes. But we are fighting between this like decentralization and privacy. Yeah because everyone is get mad about current mm -hmm. fiat system, right? Yeah. Because everyone like, anyone can control your money in terms of banks right. and anyone can look inside of it in terms of governance yes. and government. And we're on one side, we want to fight against it. On the other side, we want to fit to it yeah. and also fight for our rights. It's like a huge challenge. So, so my prediction for this is that uh, there'll be two parallel blockchain kind of networks. One is, you know, decentralized, which is what people use. But as this technology improves and there are like privacy features, governments are also looking to this to replace their own fiat currency, right? Like there's experiment with CBDC, right? Central yeah. Bank Digital Currency. I think the first version of it is pretty basic and I think no one will really use it unless you force them to use it. But you know, with technology improvements in blockchain, like you know, even the Torn uh, blockchain technology, Central banks will be learning from this. They will not use Ton, of course. They will not use Ethereum. They will not use Bitcoin. They will create their own blockchain, but they will learn from the technology there. So what we're trying to do is a big experiment. We're funding the experiment so that governments can follow and you know, see what's uh, the advantages of the blockchain technology. Okay. Yes. Super interesting talk. I'm really enjoying it. Yes. So Hank, DVF Labs investing not only in Ton, right? <laughs> You're in the more ecosystems. Tell us more about your investment strategy, for which products you are looking for, what are your current investments, or basically anything around these topics. So we are actually a blockchain agnostic and technology agnostic company when we do investments. We invest in everything Web3. The key thing we look for criteria is that we're looking for projects which have a goal of having a token that can be listed just because of our DNA as a trading firm. We want to help these projects with liquidity, I mean, that's one of our key value and strength. Of course, we can help with security, we can help with, uh, you know, advising on treasury management, but I think our core DNA is still liquidity provision. So that's uh, the key thing we look for as a minimum filter for investing projects, but we look for exciting projects all the time. We have invested in GameFi, we have invested in DEX, we have invested in security, privacy tokens, you know, yeah. Okay, did you have any exclusions for companies who had no tokenomics? We have made exceptions before, and we continue to make exceptions for exceptional companies, which is you know doing amazing technology, like infrastructure kind of businesses. Okay. Yeah. Can so you we tell, do that. Yeah. Can you tell more about like particular examples? Yes. So recently, we made a significant equity investment into a U.S.-based 
Web3 data search company called Signal, Signal, S-Y-N, S-Y-G-N-A-L dot X-Y-Z. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it uh, Web3 data more easily searchable. So like the Google for Web3. Okay. Yeah. I know that we have some kind of the same problem um, project on Ton. Have you heard about it? Um, we have not heard of similar like search projects on okay. uh, Ton. Uh, it'll be very interesting if someone can create you know like a sort of indexer of the Ton blockchain. We've seen similar ones, you know, in Solana, you know, in other other forms like Etherscan, right? Yeah. Okay. And with Nansen out there as well. Yeah. What other interesting projects you have invested in, like recently, last year or something? Where do you see like potential now? Right. So I think I'll share that we invested into a project called Fancy, which is using a Torn uh, blockchain. Yeah. Actually, I don't know the details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Where do you see why why Fancy? Like just mindset perception. Right. So we, we did our own technical due diligence. Of course, uh, them building on Torn, we talk to them, you know, they understand what they're trying to do. You know, uh, we see that there is a strong community. So, you know, and they also have a plan to, you know, launch a token to, to, to list it as well, right? So hence, we, we, we are backing them. Okay, it fits to all your requirements. Correct, it fits all my requirements, that's right. Okay, I understand. Hang, I have another question. All right. Uh, Torn is just young yes. blockchain. And there is already a lot of adults on mm -hmm. the market, like Solana, Ethereum, and so on, where builders on Ton can search like for inspiration in other blockchains that they can build and transfer, or not do it, like stupidly copy paste, but yeah. maybe like improve it. That makes sense to make on Tons. Where do you see those potentials? So I think GameFi and you know uh, game platforms is one of the strongest use cases for blockchain, just because. Uh, game players, you know, they understand digital currency, they understand trading, you know, they understand the whole point of, you know, having a marketplace for trading, you know, game items and you know, you know, potentially even look at NFT, right? So if you look at geographically, you know, Japan and Korea are one of the big gaming markets, right? And they also naturally become one of the biggest blockchain uh, cryptocurrency markets as well. So if you draw a similar parallel, you know, this is where I think that it will be one of the mass adoption use cases for, you know, Ton, Ton Play. That's right. Okay, perfect answer. Question, I just recently heard very interesting opinion. It was like for me, whoa, it, it is definitely like this. And person told, now gaming market on blockchain is basically broken. Before gaming was about enjoying. Yeah. You never heard about like digital coins. Yes, you had problems with selling your sword or anything. <laughs> and yeah. basically you did it like through some kind of middlemans, yeah. but you were enjoying the game. And right now, what I see is like, there is no AAA games yes. on blockchain yet. They're trying to be built. Mm -hmm. And what I see is happening on <clears throat> blockchain gaming is that people come in to earn. And it's even called like play to earn. So it's not about joy. It's more about like making Income. money. Yeah, that's so right. gaming is broken. Is it like, correct opinion or how do you perceive it and maybe what is the future of it to fix it back? I, I share your views as well, I agree. Uh, so in the last two years, you know, in crypto bull market, you know, everyone's trying to build something from nothing, right? They try to build Web3 from zero, right? In, in the last few months, you see that the, the industry has become more grounded, more real. You know, the project that we typically more interested in invest in the last few months are projects with traction. You know, they have a Web2 product, you know, they have a successful, you know, let's say they create a successful Web2 game. Mm -hmm. And then they add on some NFT element to it or add some payment element of it on top of it. I think those are the ones that we think will succeed more because they have real users, you know, real traction in, in the real world, right? Not like products that are created from thin air with no MVP trying to raise $50 million in the last few yes. months. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah. Perfect, perfect answer. So basically... From this, I would make my conclusion, first of all, make a good product. Yes, absolutely. If it is gaming, make it a joyful game. Correct. Make it a great experience. Then think about how to monetize it on blockchain yes. and how like to make this fairness level like through Correct. blockchain. So, so don't force the blockchain into your, your product, but more of thinking of how blockchain can help to you know, benefit your product, you know, like you know, solve some of the inefficiencies, you know, in-game inefficiencies, for example. I also think that here should be additional players who will allow Web2 companies to be to fit more this Web3, right? Mm -hmm. Because like there is projects, for example, you have Web2 game and there can be some kind of Web3 technologies that will only concentrate on like 
helping those Web2 companies to fit this blockchain world. Web2 companies shouldn't even be caring about like understanding blockchain and yeah. what is happening. And there is a space like for some kind of technology mm. companies like Stripe did it on Web2. Yes. Maybe someone will made it on Web3. Okay, so I think this is where the next generation of crypto company, Web3 companies might come about, you know, supported by, of course, blockchain ecosystems like Toncoin Fund, you know. So what you mentioned is very interesting because Web2 companies should focus on building their own products, for example, right? They should have another software integration company or even an SDK provider that can convert, you know, uh, your Web2 uh, platform with additional layer for blockchain, right? So I think over the next few years or few months, we will see more of these technology and companies frameworks coming up where you can just show you adopt blockchain technology, right? Plug in into your, your, yes. your system, like payments, right? Like Stripe. Yeah. And again, this is the same like with this fiat uh, centralized world of regulation and this like Web3 ideals that everyone like perceive. Web2 companies will probably like still for the next decade, probably mm -hmm. will yeah. live on the standard servers. It Correct. will be like centralized. Correct. Here will be like a plug with Web3. So we are achieving like fairness through blockchain, but on the same way, on the same way, it's not centralized yet. Yeah. And this is the world in which we're going to like live for the next 10 years, right? Where those two systems will try to live like together. It's not like fulfilling the ideal fully decentralized game, right? Okay. So just in that. I'll take a broader point perspective here. Uh, you know, what you're trying to say is that there will be still centralization, right? But if you look at the whole DeFi technology, everything, you think about it, everything is also on public cloud. They are actually centralized on Amazon and Google Cloud. Yes. Right? So um, technology is improving, you know, blockchain technology is moving ahead. It doesn't mean that internet technology stays stagnant, right? So centralized cloud providers might also have some decentralization technologies in the next few years. So imagine if both of these are improving in parallel. In five years time, you know, potentially we could see that the internet itself is decentralized more than yes. today, right? So uh, we shouldn't discount the fact that some other technologies are also constantly improving. Like, you know, five years from now, maybe we don't even use like, uh, you know, centralized telecom operators anymore. You know, the internet might be more decentralized and you know, more fair, more, more efficient. Yeah. Okay, thank you for those answers. Uh, now a little bit about like Tone community. Yeah. It is quite huge. Yes. Uh, how do you perceive it and what do you think like next stages, what Tone community should do to make like Tone more widespread, aid, more effective, more just better, better blockchain? Okay. So I will look at this from the more uh, qualitative point of view than the quantitative, not numbers. So if you look at other blockchain ecosystems, you know, when they have ecosystem, their community, um, some of these blockchains have local chapters, right? Independently run chapters of each from each country. Mm -hmm. And then they might get uh, funding from the main foundation. So that's one approach that we could take, you know, uh, you know, community can be in form of Discord group, Telegram groups, physical communities and countries, meetups, right? Okay. Okay. That's the, the, the user base kind of uh, mass adoption kind of uh, community we're talking about. Next, what we need to do is we need to take care of the developer community, right? We have seen the launch of the new uh, Ton um, developer portal, right? So I think it's very helpful to you know have more developers because Ton uses Fancy, right, as the main uh, programming language. We need more developers to be interested in you know coding in this language. Right? And we need to have more you know, security people who are willing to audit this thing as well to make it more robust and resilient. So I think we cannot neglect, neglect the fact that builders need to understand and use this uh, technology, this language, and make it easy for them to access it. You know, it could be even so easy that you know, university students can just go and figure out how to do it themselves, you know, build projects on it. You know, totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Like, get developers in Fancy is super tough. That's right. But the next challenge when they touch in Fancy, and even if they succeeded, when they succeeded yeah. the, in the understanding how Fancy works, yeah. they need to build something. Yes. And at this moment, they're doing this transition from being a developer to becoming a builder and entrepreneur. Yes. And developers are not originally businessmen, right? right. Yeah. And this is where the biggest problem from my perspective also, it's next big problem which is happening, that projects not able like, to hit traction they don't know how to do marketing and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you have any view on how this challenge should be like solved? Because in long term, we don't only need to bring more developers, we also need to create like, like a system for them. Yeah. How to start? 
Because when found looking on the application of very promising technology, it's already built by someone, at least experienced one. Mm -hmm. He already overcomes his challenges. And for many newcomers, it's like whole new world mm -hmm. where they need to understand what they should do. And do you see any like potential how we're going to solve it? Okay, so I will address this specifically to the Torn blockchain. So there's two ways to do this. Number one, we have incubators, right? Incubators, you allow you know, developers, builders to come in and then you can match them with you know, entrepreneurs or business majors or marketing people, right? So they can come together and try to build hackathons you know, and try to get grants for, the, for building these things. That's from the, the ground up. Next, uh, we can also do is what we can ask successful projects on other ecosystem to adopt the Ton blockchain as well, right? To support multiple blockchains. Yeah, so right. that's one way to actually you know, kickstart this whole thing in a very quick way. And then you know other developers can then slowly follow, yeah. And then support this you know successful projects. Yeah, totally makes sense. I had one idea actually about how Ton blockchain can grow or maybe like get an interest like from another field. Yes. Uh, I used to build Meditech mm -hmm. uh, with virtual reality. Oh wow! So basically, what we did, we came to healthcare hackathons with virtual reality like technology. Saying them, you know, you can, you can look on the medicine from this perspective. And we were like kind of infusing technology in the centralized classical area of healthcare. What if we will try like to present on blockchain on the hackathons which are like technically related? Imagine like logistic hackathon have nothing to do with Web3. Correct. But someone will go and speak here about like Ton blockchain and opportunities yeah. on it because first emerging like attention from those uh, areas was like five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone was talking about like Ledger, I mean like centralized blockchain and it was like painful to use it. Yes. Now Telegram is a next generation yes. and those classical markets are not aware about it. Yeah. Can we do something in this area? So yeah, I think this is where the Tong Coin Fund and you know the the whole uh, um, ecosystem building kind of funds are here for right. It's, uh, other than just you know attracting people to come into your ecosystem, you go out to other people's ecosystem, right? So we must have you know ambassadors you know who go out to different markets like it's in medicine, right? Could be in aviation for data security. We can talk about you know like commodities trading, trade finance, you know. Uh, these industries have their own problems, but they don't understand that there's blockchain, they don't understand the technology. So we need to share with them and then maybe, you know, together, you know, there could be some new innovation and new uh, uh, solutions. Yeah. Okay. So I hope we will start to do something like this. Definitely. I think we will, we will work together closely with the foundation to, you know, try to make this more uh, okay. realistic. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. This was a perfect talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for thank coming. You, thank you for telling like yes. a lot, a lot about like liquidity indexes, future of blockchain, yeah. and where you're investing. So, guys, I hope you liked it too. Please put a like, put subscription. Thank it you. really like allows us to bring those ideas to more builders and tons. So, don't hesitate to do it. Thank you, Hank. Thank you for thank being you, here. Yes, I really enjoyed it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Great talk. Yeah, yeah, Thanks yeah. again. Thanks, Anton. Appreciate it. I enjoy doing this. <laughs> Me too. Oh, my leg. <laughs> Me too, my leg.